profit organization. And I should um, let you know that we are recording this session. And if you if you don't feel okay being the recording, uh, I, I need to ask um, you to um, log out if if you don't want to be in the recording. But we are recording the session. Thank you. Um, Incision is International Student Surgical Network is a not-for-profit organization for um, medical students and public health students, early career physicians who are interested in a field of global surgery. Um, Incision started off as an informal um, working group of the International Federation of Medical Student Association, IFMS, in 2014. And today it represents over 5,000 members in over 80 um, different countries and with more than 50 national working groups of which um, Incision Ghana is one. Um, the Incision envisions a world where there is safe, affordable and timely um, surgical anesthesia and obstetric care to everyone, anywhere, everywhere, irrespective of geographical location or background and some of the core values that are instilled in this institution is capacity building education and mentorship now incision carries out these activities and um, through three main pillars advocacy and and incision has been involved in a lot of advocacy campaigns over the years and um, one of the the main things with respect to advocacy that incision has actually um, instituted is the global surgery day where we, we celebrate global surgery and advocate for, for our mission and vision. The other pillar that um, Incision works through is education. And um, we've been involved in a number of educational programs, some hackathons. And I must mention that Incision Ghana itself held its um, first educational series. And we are, we're going to, um, a few weeks ago, and we're going to um, look to um, organize the, the next one in the next coming weeks. And then we get to research, which is basically one of the things we are um, looking at addressing today. So there the, the are internal and external research projects in Incision. And I believe those in Incision for a while would, would know some of these things. And um, we are, looking at um, this uh, research mentorship program to promote research capacity as one of the things that we are doing as Incision Ghana. Now, Incision um, holds the largest um, symposium for global surgery um, via the Incision Global Surgery Symposium, which started in uh, May, 2018. And actually that was the, the first time I met um, our second speaker, uh, Dominique, and um, we've had the next one that was in 2019 in Kigali, and then in 2020, which was a virtual one because of COVID, and then 2021 in Sarajevo, Bosnia, and Herzegovina. So to the subject of the day, Incision Ghana Research Mentorship Program. This program is in two components, the online webinars, which will run monthly, and a practical component where we pair mentees, selected mentees with uh, mentors to guide them through the research process from the start of or from the research question to the point where they actually publish a peer reviewed manuscript. Unfortunately, we have many, many more mentees than mentors. We still have some mentors who would confirm um, how many mentees they are willing to take. And so we are hoping that this waiting list um, gets short as the, the days and weeks go by. Now the waiting list is not going to be idle. There are a number of things we are thinking for the waiting list. So if you are on the waiting list and um, you have a suggestion of someone you think can mentor you, you can just let us know, we'll send you down the pile. But then everyone on the waiting list would be involved in a collaborative research we are planning so that everyone at the end of the day gets something out of this, this program. Also, all those on the waiting list will be grouped according to their interests, subjects of interest, where we would uh, put people in, people in groups of eight to 10 
to, to actually carry out a systematic review and meta-analysis in areas that are um, uh, of interest to them. Without much ado, I would quickly go through some of our mentors. And I want to be um, say that we are really, really grateful to all the people, all the, the mentors who have agreed to, to, to take mentees under their wings and guide them through this process. Um, I'll leave the first two, but then we have Mr. Um, Ali Navi, who is a consultant surgeon in Cambridge University Hospital. We have Prof. Daniel Anson, who is the Dean of the Medical School in the Conf um, Kumasi, uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, SMS. He's a professor of pediatrics. We have uh, Ms. Aisha Nuani, who is a clinical lecturer at the Cambridge University Hospital and uh, the University of Cambridge Clinical School of Medicine. She's in the upper GI department. We have Ms. Alice Chai, who is a specialty registrar at the Imperial College London. We have Mr. Alan Askari, who is the chair of the Surgical Trainees in East of England, Research Collaborative. He's also an upper GI registrar. And then we have uh, Dr. Mamiti Boche, who is a pediatric surgeon at the Ridge Hospital and also the founder and executive director of Hope for Little Life organization. And we have Dr. Edwin Yenli, who is the head of department of surgery for the University for Development Study. He is a urologist. And then we have um, Professor Charles Mock, who is a joint professor of surgery and epidemiology at the University of Washington and an associate editor of the World Journal of Surgery. We also have uh, our very own Professor uh, Francis Abantanga, who is a pediatric surgeon. He's the former head of department and dean of school of medicine for the University for Development Studies. We have Professor Stephen Tabiri, who is a, a professor of surgery and also the dean of the UDS SMHS and a deputy director at the NIHR um, Research Unit on Global Surgery. And then we have Mr. James Glassby, who is an NIH HR doctoral fellow in global surgery. And of course, Dr. Theophilos Ajesu is an ENT surgeon and also editor for the journal associated with the University for Development Studies. And then we have finally, um, Dr. Joseph Bonny, who is a specialist uh, emergency medicine practitioner at the Confounder Institution Hospital. He's also a research fellow and an editor of the Ghana Medical Journal. We are very, very grateful to all these mentors. We have some other mentors who are in a pipeline, but I yet to confirm how many mentors they are willing to take under their wings. And we are very, very, very grateful to them. Finally, um, this is the, the program flow for the next um, 10 months. Um, and we're hoping to, to have you all at these, these webinars. Um, we've had a lot of support from GIGS, Incision Global, and ACE, the MRCS. And I'll just uh, play just a short video from one of our sponsors, and then we'll take it from there. I think um, my co-host, um, Dr. Dokas Osei, would introduce the first speaker. Dokas. Yeah, so I actually have the greatest honor to um, introduce our first speaker for today. Um, she's always been an inspiration to me. The first time I actually um, got to know about her was through um, a professor of mine. And, and ever since then, um, she actually doesn't cease to amuse me with her credentials and her achievements. She's really a pioneer in surgery. Um, she is a graduate of the University of Ghana Medical School. She's actually a professor of pediatric surgery and anatomy. She, she's a past president of uh, Medical Women's Association of Ghana. 
also the past president of the Medical Women's International Association from 2010 to 2013. And also the second African to head this 100 year old professional association. She, in addition to that, she is the past head of Department of Surgery of the UG Medical School. She, um, she was also the past medical affairs and past chief executive officer of Ghana's leading hospital, Kolebutichin Hospital. In addition to that, she is also the co-founder and president of the first private medical school ever to be in Ghana. I've actually met some of the students and they are very good. They, they are above average uh, medical students and medical doctors. Their first batch actually graduated in 2010 and second batch in December, 2021. Professor Hesse is a member of the Net, uh, Network Women for Women's Rights, uh, Net Rights in Ghana. He's also an educator and a trainer of the undergraduate medical students and postgraduate levels, um, surgeon in training, surgeon in general, and pediatric surgery trainees um, for various medical schools across the country and postgraduate um, colleges nationally and across the West Africa. She's also the elected chairman of the Ghana chapter of the West African College of Surgeons in 2021 and has been nominated as an internal assessor um, for the new program that is um, West, um, Ghana College is organizing a faculty of orthopedics and trauma, oh, um, in, which, which was started in 2021. On top of all this, she's married to Adupe Hesse, a Reverend Minister of the Presbyterian Church and a professor of internal medicine and physiology for over 40 years. And she's been, she, she has four children and 13 grandchildren, you know, all glory to God. And I have the privilege and the honor to introduce our first speaker, Professor Ifwa Hesse. Let's um, invite her to the floor. Prof. Professor Hesse. Teddy, have you unmuted here? Teddy. Yeah, please unmute here. Yes. So probably you've been unmuted now. All right, good, good evening, everyone. I was just telling Dr. Stokas, I've lost my voice. I have a terrible upper respiratory tract infection and unfortunately, <laughs> uh, <laughs> this evening has been really bad. And it's a pity because I would really have liked to be able to share so much with you. In terms of research and where we want to go, where one needs to go, people ask the question, why research? Why do we have to bother? And I, I use them as an example. You know, we have a lot of sayings, I can't sayings, but the person who is cutting the path does not realize that the path is crooked. And it's somebody who's looking at them from behind to realize that the path is crooked. So that's the same analogy, really, when it comes to doing research. It's very important if you're going to be an effective clinician, if you're going to be, if you're going to be, a, if you're going to be an effective clinician, if you're going to be able to um, to give your patients the kind of results that you want them to have, you have to be able to 
self audit, to look at yourself, to look at your record, to look at where you're coming from, to see where you're going, to chart a better path because all of us should be looking, trying to make things better than we found them. Somebody <clears throat> through research realized that using uh, ear directly on the patient to be able to listen to breath sounds and heart sounds was not the best. And it was through those observations, which then started them on to look at what would be a better alternative. And in looking for that, that was how the first stethoscope was invented by Lennox. And such has been the progress and the intentions in medicine throughout the years. It is by looking at yourself, doing a self audit. So you start with documenting everything that you're doing. In medicine, we say, if it is not recorded, it has not been done. So even at the stage you are at, medical officer, house officer, resident, you are dealing with patients on a daily basis. Get into the habit of having a journal and recording all your cases. The age, the vital details, what they came in with, what you did and what the outcome was. Then at the end of a week or a month, you just look at what you have got. Some things may stare at you. Why are all our patients who come in with this particular condition ending up this way? Why are we not getting better results? And through that, that might then develop into a research question for you to investigate and find out the cause and see what can be done to make things better, to improve solutions can be found to the issues you have identified. So basically that is what identifying a research question and identifying uh, starting on a research path entails. It just requires you to be diligent in recording and in keeping notes of whatever you have to do. So it's not something that is extraordinary. You don't have to have a flashlight go off somewhere before you can start on the simplest bit of research. What you're doing on a daily basis, if you record, you may see patterns. We look for patterns, good patterns. We look for why they are good and what we can do to sustain that or make them even better. Bad results, bad patterns. We look to see what was bad about them. Why did it turn out that way? what can be done to improve the outcomes. And through that, you will come up with information which when you share with others would help to improve clinical practice overall. So that's what I would like to start off as an introduction to research. It is not anything that's necessarily high falutin. You don't have to uh, makes some earth shattering discovery. But every single thing that helps to audit your practice, that helps to improve your outcomes, does constitute research and will lead to a better quality of life, a better outcome, a better result for your patients. Uh, I'd like to stop here for now. Thanks, Dockers. <laughs> so much for Hesse for making the time to talk to us and to inspire us even though you were you are not so well and uh, we wish you a speedy recovery and um, we are most grateful for your time so up next um would like teddy over to you to introduce the second speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Dokas, and um, thank you very, very much to um, Prof. Hesse. These were, these were gems she's just released in the last 
10 to 15 minutes. Um, I wish I wish you all the best, uh, Professor. I wish you um, best help and thank you, thank you. That's so much love to even come um, to us in, in in this state to to speak to us. We really, really, really appreciate it, and we don't take it for granted. Um, I would um, introduce our next um, speaker. So our next speaker is Dr. Dominique Vervoet. Um, it's really an honor to, to introduce um, Dom this evening. Um, Dominique is a, um, a PhD in health um, services research student at the Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation at the University of Toronto. He's studying disparities in thoracic aortic surgery he completed his um, medical education at KU Leuven in Belgium. He had his dual degree in MPH and um, MBA at the John Hopkins University. He is a, a former fellow of the Harvard program in global surgery and social change. Dominique is the founding president of the Global Cardiac Initiative and also um, which, which um, this initiative actually advocates for the 6 billion people who do not have access to cardiac surgical care when they need it. In addition, he is um, the co-founder and past chair of Incision um, Global. Dominique is also an advisor for the Global Surgery Foundation, and he is an advisor for the John Hopkins Global Surgery Initiative. He's a board member for the Global Alliance for Rheumatic and Congenital Heart Diseases and the co-founder for the Gender Equity Initiative in Global Surgery. He's featured in many um, platforms, including New York Times, BMJ, JAMA, um, Al Jazeera, et cetera. He's well published and we are really, really grateful, um, Dominique, for, for honoring us and, and coming on to speak to us. Over to you, Dom. Great, thank you so much, Teddy. Thank you for the kind invitation. Um, I'll quickly start with sharing my screen, but I already wanna say um, again, a big thank you, but also that uh, it's a great honor to be here with you all specifically for Incision Ghana, not just because of my past history with Incision as well as knowing Teddy personally through IGSS in the year since, but also because I uh, spent the summer of 2016 at, Com at Kumasi um, working with Dr. Adam Giedu at Komponache. So it's uh, nice to kind of be back at least virtually um, six years later. Um, I'll start with sharing my screen, which I just want a quick confirmation from somebody that you can see this. Yeah, we can see this, Dominic. Okay. Perfect. Um, that way I know that you can see what I'm talking about. Um, but the talk today is really kind of giving you a bit of a perspective of the basics of global surgery research, and it's specifically how you kind of get started with drafting your research question and getting a sense of what you want to do. Um, the first few slides are a bit of an introduction to global surgery, just because I want to make sure that everybody's a bit on the same page, although this might be a bit of a repetition for some of you, given some of um, previous activities and webinars by Incision Ghana as well. Um, but the field of global surgery, which is really um, talking about addressing surgical disparities all across the globe, is still a relatively new field, despite the fact that this is something that should have been around for many decades, if not centuries longer. And um, Dr. Hafman Mahler, who is a former um, chief, the former director general of the World Health Organization, was the first in 1980 to talk about the issues pertaining to access to surgical care worldwide. But at the time he was speaking to a group of surgeons and there was really not much that happened with that moral call to action. So we really have to fast forward to several decades later, and this is 35 years later in 2015, when it was really the first time that at a global scale and by large groups, which had a lot of influence being on the left from the World Bank, in the middle, an international panel by the Lancet Commission on Global Surgery, and then on the right by the World Health Organization and 194 ministries of health worldwide, 
that these documents kind of came about in 2015 and really set the stage of what global surgery is that we nowadays talk about, but also really giving a perspective about what are some of the gaps in terms of access to surgical care and how can we potentially solve them. And it's really that that's um, result from research in the years prior to that research and research collaborations from across the globe that have resulted in this and eventually informed policymakers to say, okay, well, now we know what the gaps are and now we have to address this because what we thought previously about the role of surgery in global health is really different from what we see now in terms of the data. So that's why it's so important to um, get started with global surgery research if you have an interest in research. And as Professor Hesse has mentioned as well, in terms of our, our role as clinicians as well, in terms of caring for our patients, research is really a pivotal um, point in our careers as well. Um, so these are kind of the key messages that came out of the Lancet Commission. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but I guess that the most important thing is that 5 billion people still lack access to safe surgery and anesthesia care when needed. And it's really critical that we address that, not just clinically, but also from a health systems level. And to do so from a health systems level will really require us to understand what are the barriers in terms of access to surgical care and what are some interventions that help with um, dismantling those barriers. So as you can see in 2015, and this is a quick snapshot from, um, from PubMed when we look at global survey literature, you see that there's a bit of a, an increase over time with a bit of a, a peak in 2015, an earlier peak, given, as I mentioned, uh, the pivotal year with the three documents coming out, which also led to a lot of uh, attention from different academic groups. But you see a steady increase over the years, and uh, I'm expecting that 2022 will be no different. Obviously, it's a smaller peak because we're only three months in, but there's really a steady increase, and that's thanks to increased awareness of the issues of global surgery, but also thanks to the interest and the motivation of uh, future surgeons and current surgeons, just like all of you on this call as well. So what I want to do in this talk is really giving you um, a bit of an oversight about what are some uh, types of global surgery research that exist and things that you can kind of get involved with whether that's in person with data collection and so forth, or from your own homes in terms of just using your computer to do research, as well as how to kind of get started with really doing your baseline literature review and drafting your research question, so that when you're gonna do your research, you really know what you wanna do, and you have a bit of a, a recipe or a plan so that you know what are the next steps and you aren't searching for everything step-by-step step along the way. So I want to start with global surgery research to give you a bit of an example of what types of research there are. Um, but I want to um, state first and foremost that there is, um, while there has been an increase in global surgery li literature over time, it's not always been as equitable in terms of who is publishing, whether that is in terms of authors from high income countries versus low and middle income countries, or whether that is in terms of seniority. So for example, whether it's a trainee versus um, somebody who's more senior or in, in other fashions as well. Um, like for example, men versus women and so forth. Um, and so here you see two bibliometric analyses that have been performed. The bibliometric analyses are kind of a snapshot of research to look at mostly authorship and citations and what is being published on as opposed to the actual content of research. And um, But both have looked at global surgery research. The one on the left, um, which used a different definition from the one on the right, the left one looked at research that was taking place in low and middle income countries and using that as a definition of global surgery, found that um, over time there was an increase in LMIC um, authorship, especially at the first and last um, positions, which is commendable. Um, but if we're using a broader definition of global surgery, which also pertains to um, discussions or opinion pieces, editorials, review articles, and so forth, which you can see on the right, um, there's really a, a big imbalance and there is still a predominance of high income country authors in global surgery research. And that's really not what we want. We want it to be locally led. And obviously um, it's not good if we're seeing the numbers on the right bottom, 
um, that they would persist in years to come. So I have to commend um, Teddy and the Incision Ghana leadership really about this uh, research mentorship program, um, because it's going to be so pivotal, um, not for all of you to become better clinicians and really get more passionate about research, but also ensuring that the global surgery research is locally led and is also correctly informed as well, because ultimately um, all of that research will lead to informing policymakers and lead to influencing health systems interventions. But now to kind of go more to the technical points in terms of some types of research, and you might have come across with uh, some of them, you might have done some of them, um, there's really a couple of different categories. The first one is primary research, is really where you yourself are going to collect data, whether it's qualitative data or quantitative data, and I'll show you in the next slide what the difference is there. It can be a review article where you really kind of summarize the literature, so you don't have to collect data, but you're just trying to summarize publications. It could be, um, as I gave you an example already, a bibliometric analysis where you mostly try to see what are some of the trends in research, and it can be a variety of other types of research for which I'll also give a couple of examples. In terms of primary research, quantitative research is really about um, core data, so data that is numerical, and that can be clinical data that you see in your hospital that you say, okay, I want to collect um, clinical data in terms of blood pressure, in terms of um, other patient characteristics like age, like sex or gender, and so forth and so forth, or it can be registries or online data. Qualitative research is more about a, a broad a broader um, perspective of research, and that can be questionnaires to assess, okay, how are individuals or patients experiencing care, what is their quality of life, and so forth, and it can also be done in person through interviews and focus groups, and mixed method is really just a combination. However, ultimately, with each of these, with primary research, it's, it's all about collecting the data primarily and then analyzing the data as well. With um, review articles, then it's slightly different because you're not going to be collecting data. You're going to see what literature is already published and how can we kind of summarize it. And there's a different different types of review articles. Just to give you a bit of a flavor there, um, just because it, it's good to know the difference there, is that a narrative review article is basically the the most basic of review articles. You don't have to do a systematic approach. You don't have to necessarily be transparent in terms of how you identify the literature. And you can infuse a lot of your own opinion in that as well, in terms of saying, okay, in our practice, we do this, et cetera, or I believe that this is not the right method because of this research that I have found. Um, whereas a scoping and a systematic review tends to be much more, uh, much more objective and um, is really focused on summarizing and um, in a quantitative way also in terms of systematic reviews, um, quantifying the effects of research. So for example, a scoping review is an example that you see in the right top where um, we wanted to look at, okay, everything that was published about human rights and global surgery, what is it and what has not been published. A systematic review then is something where you trying to find a specific question and you try to answer that by summarizing the literature. But eventually all of these articles, all of these review articles are intended to be novel. So you wanna avoid duplication. So always make sure that you're not doing something that somebody else has already done. Bibliometric analyses, I won't cover too much about this because I already covered this, um, but this is really about publishing trends to see what is published and what is not, who has published and who has not, um, how is it in terms of citations, in terms of equity of authorship and so forth. And then in terms of a variety of other types of research can be something as widely varying from social media, looking at how many people are using Twitter or hashtags, how many people are reading your posts when you post something, all the way to policy analysis, so policy documents by your Ministry of Health or by the WHO and so forth, where you see what is the content of these policies? Is this addressing what it should be addressing? Is it missing something? What are some of the trends? What are the impacts of that? Um, and so you can really see that you can arguably research everything, but you always wanna make sure that you research for the sake of change, whether that is in terms of your clinical practice or in terms of the field of global surgery or whichever field you're doing research in, and not just because you want to publish. You always want to make sure that you're doing research with a clear intent as opposed to just for the sake of publishing. Now to um, build your research career, I'll give a couple of examples, uh, more personal examples and, and personal experiences, just because this might be a bit more relatable. 
Um, and that is to give the example of global cardiac surgery, which is the subset of cardiac surgery within global surgery, which is my area of interest. And um, I'm also doing my, my PhD in that as well. And it's something that I'm hoping to do for the rest of my career. But when I was starting my, my global cardiac surgery research back in 2017, I realized, well, Unfortunately, there's really nothing out there. We're talking about global surgery, which is great. We're talking about specialties that were rapidly advancing, like pediatric surgery, neurosurgery, OB-GYN anesthesia, trauma, and so forth, which is fantastic and should be done. But for some reason, nobody in the field of cardiac surgery was talking about it. And in the field of global surgery, nobody was talking about cardiovascular diseases, yet cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death worldwide. And so what I started doing is, is just doing my own research and getting a sense of, okay, who has published, what has been published, what has not been published, and then gradually trying to add um, pieces to that puzzle to see what can we still do to inform the field of global cardiac surgery and to inform societies, policymakers, that this is something that we also need to, be, need to address, not by taking away resources from other fields, but really ensuring that we're not neglecting a big component of medicine. And there will be some challenges, and these challenges are either related to myths, because what unfortunately the field of global cardiac surgery has faced is that a lot of people thought, okay, we don't really need cardiac surgery, we need other things, um, but if cardiovascular diseases are the leading cause of death and a disability, well, that's a great enough argument already. Um, in terms of really what academics can play a role if they aren't yet cardiac surgeons, um, and similarly what you as trainees can do if you aren't yet surgeons, anesthesiologists, or obstetricians, is really a lot, and that can pertain to epidemiological research, it can pertain to um, review articles, can be pertaining to supporting your mentors and so forth, and there's really that opportunity that you can play in that. Um, but also from a policy perspective is, is that there it remains a neglect of mention both of cardiac surgery as well as cardiovascular diseases at large. And this is something that isn't just a challenge for cardiovascular care, but it's something that all surgical disciplines are facing and something that you will notice as well. That being said, there are a variety of opportunities, and that is that there is still so much to do. And that's why I want to encourage you to think broadly and, and try to think creatively as well in terms of answering some of these questions, especially because sometimes we have to rely on very limited or little or even no data at all in terms of answering some of these questions. However, eventually with trial and error and by connecting with others, you're able to kind of flesh out the questions that you want to answer and flesh out the methodologies to eventually answer those questions. But primarily, I think the field of global survey has already shown that this is really a, a tight network of people all across the globe who are trying to support each other. And the Incision Ghana Research Mentorship Program is a really great example where um, people who are mentors to mentees are really trying to um, pull people up and make sure that you get to the same stage and even further than where the mentors are. So um, this is a, a great field to be in, and I definitely want to encourage you to stay involved both with global surgery as well as with Incision Ghana. Now, as I kind of transition to the literature review and research question point, I want to give a couple of closing remarks on this first part of the discussion, um, just as a couple of tips that I have experienced as I um, got involved with research, and that is to follow through on your promises. If you're involved with research and you say to your mentor, to your professor, okay, I want to get involved with your research, make sure that you stay with them, that you continue with that project and that you just that you don't abandon it because they are obviously taking their time as well to mentor you and to get you involved. But at the same time, this is a great opportunity for you to learn as well. And with that, with the skills that you learn as well as with the opportunities that come up, this will be of great benefit to you. Um, secondly, is that it is more important to learn the skills than it is to publish. Once you learn the skills of how to do research, publications will follow because the skills that you learn now will be skills that you will be using for the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years, if not longer throughout the rest of your career. And eventually the publications will follow as well. Um, start with low hanging fruit. You don't have to get started with the most advanced, most biggest um, types of research. You can start with smaller types of research to really get an understanding of how does this work and how can I fit in as a trainee. Um, and then once you start publishing, get a bit of a sense of, okay, where do you want to publish? Who are the journals? Who are the audiences? What are the right fits of the research that I want to do? Um, just so that you can find the right audience to read and to use your, um, your research as well. 
But I want to give a bit of a caveat just because I think this is an unfortunate trend in recent years, and that is the occurrence of predatory journals. And this is something that's affecting researchers all across the globe. And this is unfortunately journals that aren't real, that are fake journals that unfortunately solicit requests for you to submit research, whether they send it to your email, as you can see in my inbox on the right bottom, or it is that they reach out to you on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on Facebook, et cetera, and say, okay, well, we want a publication of you, send something to us, um, but then they end up asking you money um, in exchange for publication, but it is actually not a real journal, um, and they are really just there to take your money. So be careful of that, and always try to speak to others as well if you're trying to find the right journal just to make sure that uh, everybody agrees, but also that you're finding um, the right and, uh, and best fit as well. Um, and then with regards to that as well as the, the, the trend of open access publishing, and this is a very unfortunate reality that open access publishing, which is great and commendable and something that we need to have, has become a money-making business for academic publishers. Now, in some cases, there are waivers where they say, okay, if you're from a low middle income country, you don't have to pay, which is fantastic, but not all journals have that, which is very unfortunate. And you see a tweet at the right top, which um, was very recent and caused a lot of backlash. And that is that the big nature journals um, started open access and were very excited about it and thought they did a great thing. But to publish it, they were requesting 11,000 US dollars. And 11,000 US dollars is the price of a car, is the price of a decent car in the US. And it's really a lot of money, especially for people who don't have research funding. So if you're from a low middle income country, or if you're a trainee, or if you are a researcher but don't have research funds, it's really impossible to pay these fees. And so um, while we're going to the right direction with open access publishing, we still need to address the issue of payments. Um, these are just a couple of examples of further reading, which I don't want to dive into in this talk, but which might be of interest to some of you, and most of these are open access, so I hope some of you have been able to take a screenshot of this, um, but these are widely available by um, just Googling statistical primers or Googling um, a journal name and um, a guide to statistics and so forth, and sometimes you might find some interesting things that might help you along. So as I go to the, the latter portion, and these next few slides are more um, exemplary or more kind of serving as an example, as opposed to being very comprehensive or very um, a, a whole ton of slides, but really to give you a bit of a, um, a jump start in terms of starting with your research. And that is to do first and foremost, a literature review so that you know what is done and what especially is not done and what you can do. And the reason for that is because you want to avoid duplication. You might have an interest in a specific area that you want to answer, but if somebody's already done that, it doesn't really make sense to do the exact same thing because you're going to get the exact same results. So the more novel the research is, the more value it will add to the literature, to the field of science, to medicine, but also to yourself, because eventually um, once you start publishing, if it is novel research, you're probably going to get it out in a, in a bigger journal with a bigger audience, as opposed to when it is the same that somebody else has already done. However, when you're doing a literature review, you can also get some inspiration. And when I say inspiration, I don't want you to copy anything because I, I don't want you to get involved with um, any plagiarism, but it allows you to kind of get involved, oh, sorry, get inspired and become familiar with some of the common study designs, some of the common research tools, some of the outcomes that others use to, to actually do their research. It really gives you a bit of a flavor of what research can look like when you do it. But internally as well as really building your rationale and supporting the reason why you want to do this research and helping you draft your research question. So with an exploratory review where you really just very um, minimally or very uh, in, in basic steps are doing your, your reviews, trying to get a bit of a sense of what is already out there. You're not doing a systematic review. While it is better, it takes much more time, but you're trying to do a bit of a baseline literature review to get a sense of what has been published. And you can become familiar with it. You can kind of get a sense of who has been publishing, who can I eventually reach out to if I have any questions or to network and so forth. What is some of the influential work in the same space that you can reference and read and learn from and so forth. And uh, two examples uh, here you see on the right are PubMed, the PubMed database, which um, most of you might be aware of, um, where you see two examples where I look for cardiac surgery in Ghana at the top, just looking at using the words anywhere in an article. 
And um, below that, just looking at those words in the title and the abstract. So you can kind of play around with the database to see how you want to look for articles in a publication and try and identify the right articles that, uh, that might be of relevance for you. Now on the right bottom, you see a free um, database that is powered by artificial intelligence, by AI, and the goal of that database um, which again, I want to stress that it is free, um, is for you to identify better the right research that you're looking for. And this is a database that just like all AI tools is continuously updating, but is really an, a neat way of um, trying to find the literature that you're looking for. Um, some of the tips and tricks then, it's, uh, it's good for you to identify existing review articles if they are already out there, so you can kind of read up on the topic. So if I say, for example, you see an example on the right, if I want to look for cardiac surgery research that was done in um, over the continent of Africa over the last 20 years, I can refer to this article, um, which was a collaboration between a couple of surgeons from South Africa and the United States, um, where they summarize all of the publications in the past two decades. And that way you can read and see, okay, this is out there, this is not, but also this is kind of what is already known and, um, and what, what are some of the questions that we still need to answer. When you're doing your review, always discuss with your mentors and colleagues um, if you have any either before um, or after, but ideally both before doing the re literature review as well as after, just so you can kind of discuss both your approach and what you have found, because they might have some uh, tips as well that they have from personal experience, because everybody kind of goes through it differently. Um, but really take your time for this, because this is your foundation. You don't want to rush this in a couple of minutes and then later realize that you missed the publication that is doing the exact same thing as you, just because you haven't taken the time for your baseline literature review. So take your time. Um, it's better to spend a bit more time on this than to rush through it and regret it after. And then lastly, I want to talk about drafting your research question, because just like the literature review, it's really the foundation of your project. The problem is, if we don't know what we want to do, then it's going to be very hard to actually do it. So that's why it's so important for a research question to exist, but not just to exist, but also to be very clear and understandable. So you can give it to anybody and everybody will understand. Um, so that is also focused, that you really are specific in terms of what you want to answer. And it's not a vague statement, but you can really answer it um, in, a, in a proper manner. Um, it should be concise, so relatively brief. However, at the same time, it should be relatively complex in the sense that it shouldn't be no, not a yes or no question. If your question is, is dot, dot, dot good or bad? Well, that's not really a complex question because it's a binary response. And as opposed to that, you can look at a question that says, okay, um, what are the outcomes of dot, dot, dot? And that is a bit more of a, um, a specific research question where you can really re perform the research and give a proper answer to that as well. Research is typically arguable. Um, research is constantly changing. Medicine 100 years ago is very different than medicine today. And that is because we are continuously finding new ways of doing research, new ways of answering research questions. And because of that, research is arguable, is open to debate, and that's totally normal. Um, and is also more analytical than it is descriptive because it's really the analysis that's adding to the novelty. Um, I want to close with a, a bit of a tool there um, because I think it's important for you as you're drafting your research question that you know what you want to do. Um, and a great tool for that or a great formula for that is a PICO formula or a PCOT because some people add the T as well. And that is both population, intervention, comparator, outcomes, and if you want time as well. Here, the population is who are you studying? What, are, what is the problem that you're studying? So for example, patients with a given disease or patients living in a part of a country, et cetera. What is the intervention? So what is it that you're trying to study? Whether it's a treatment, whether it's a surgical procedure, whether it's a public health program, what is your comparator? So what are you comparing it with? And what are your outcomes? What do you want to look at? What are the, the outcomes of interest? Like, for example, mortality or access to surgery or having to pay for surgery or not and so forth. 
and time can be added or, or um, may not be added. That's kind of a more um, research or project specific, and it's really dependent on the time frame and how long the follow up should be. Um, I'll give you an example of that, and that is here: is this this question, how many people have cardiovascular disease, is a question that you can answer, but it's really a vague question, and there's many different answers to it, which makes that this is not really a good question. However, if you want to be more specific, you can um, kind of use the PICO formula to develop a research question. And this is just a research question. This is something um, that I, I, I just created on um, earlier and it's not necessarily something that has been done, not necessarily something that should be done, but it's just to give you an example of making a research question that's specific. And that could be, for example, among patients presenting to a given hospital in Ghana, and you can specify that, um, which is here your population, your P, between August 2022 and July 2023, which is the T in your formula, the time, what is the prevalence of? In this case, that's your outcome. The prevalence is how, how common is a certain thing. Um, screening confirmed cardiovascular disease, which is, in this case, your intervention compared to no cardiovascular disease, which is your comparison. And this way, it's much more specific. So when you're now going to do the research, you know what you want to do, you know which methodology to take eventually, you know how you have to answer that question, you know what to, uh, what you're trying to look for as opposed to when you have a vague question. And that's why it's so important to really be as specific as possible. Some closing tips and tricks before um, I'll let it for, um, for the Q&A if there's any questions is to, again, reach out and discuss with your mentors. Your mentors are there first and foremost to support you, um, but try to speak to as many people as possible just because different people have different IDs and it's always good um, to get different perspectives. It's good to keep reading research. It's good to keep trying to write and repeat that process because it's a matter of becoming familiar with it. It's good to start questioning things, think creatively, think outside the box, but also ask yourself, why are you doing this research? And what do you think is the value that this research will bring to the literature, to global surgery, to medicine, and so forth? And then lastly, is finding your niche and really try to see what interests you most and what excites you most in terms of doing research. If you have a specific area of research, whether it's a specific clinical area, what is specific area of research like, for example, doing data science or doing qualitative research or doing meta-analyses, et cetera. Find something that excites you most and try to make that your niche. So um, some closing thoughts here. Again, writing is rewriting because um, it's not an easy process. It doesn't matter whether it's your first research project or your 300 research project. It's always going to be hard, so never give up. It's a process of... Um, is a process that's something that we all have to go through, but it's a fun process. It's good to get, get feedback from people outside your field, just to make sure that you aren't biased towards um, what you have learned within your field, but also that it's understandable for people outside of your field, but also so that um, any biases that might exist within a certain field, let's say, for example, people in the field of global surgery saying that surgery is the most important thing ever to exist, might be something that not everybody agrees with, which is totally normal. And that's why it's always good to get feedback from people outside of your field as well, to make sure that you have a balanced view and that everything that you do in terms of your research is correctly done and correctly interpreted. It's important to hold yourself as well as others, whether it's uh, your other mentees or, or even mentors or colleagues and peers accountable because it's really uh, important that when you're doing your research um, that everybody's working together and ensuring that the research is done correctly. Um, build a routine, try and see what fits for you. If you have busy clinical days, then it might be easier for you to work in the morning or it might be easier to work in the evening, might be easier to work in the weekends. Find what fits best for you, but try to build a routine, try to build something that is more, um, that is steady and something that you can hold on to because it's all a matter of practice and creativity and experience will follow that practice. And then lastly, I want to say enjoy the research because um, all of this is an incredibly fun and rewarding experience and I want you to enjoy it to the fullest as well um, and so with that I want to close I want to thank Teddy and Incision Ghana as well for kindly inviting me I want to thank you all for being here um, and giving me the opportunity to chat with you all and I'm happy to answer any questions that there might be as well so thank you 
Thank you very much, Dominique. That was that was an excellent presentation. Um, I took so much, so much out of it. And uh, very grateful that you made that time to, to come and speak to us. Um, I'll start off with uh, a couple of questions. And then if um, anyone has any questions, you can just direct it to the page. We'll pick it up and then ask. So my first question is, Dominique, what was your major challenge when you started in terms of research? And how did you overcome this? Yeah, it's a, it's a, that's a very good question. It's a very important question. And to give you a bit of a perspective, so I'm originally from Belgium and I did my medical school there. And uh, unlike some other countries, like for example, in the UK, in the US, in Ghana, it's very common to do research in medical school. In Belgium, it's not at all. There's no part of research that's part of your medical school. And most people graduate medical school by doing no research at all, by having no publications. And that's totally normal because it's a different culture. And uh, it's really, that's really difficult if you um, are kind of used to an environment where research is not normally done and where you are in kind of graduate we uh, introduced it out. So for me, I had a bit of a personal interest just because I had an interest in global surgery, but also an interest in cardiac surgery. And I had a, a bit of an interest in terms of trying to learn more, whether it was in terms of medical school or in trying to figure out some of the questions that we don't know yet. So as I kind of became involved with research, I tried to find mentors. And in that case, it was um, two cardiac surgeons at my university in, in Belgium who were very supportive, as well as then eventually, as I mentioned, Dr. Adam Gieru at Confanache, um, who were great in terms of kind of sharing their experiences in terms of doing research. Because when I started, I had no clue of how to do research. I knew PubMed existed. I didn't know how to write a research article. I didn't know how to analyze it and so forth. And so I really had to start from the scratch. And so when I started, it was just a matter of finding the right mentors for you and finding somebody who has research experience and is willing to share his or her experiences with research. Um, and for you to really take the time and learning those skills, whether it's doing a literature review on PubMed, whether it's doing um, basic statistical analyses, whether it's doing data collection by um, providing a questionnaire to patients or, or doing basic science lab research and so forth, really getting those skills and trying to hone those and eventually you will kind of gradually build that experience. So I think um, I think this is a fantastic solution. This program to, to address that is really trying to connect mentees to mentors to ensure that they gradually get exposed to um, different research experiences and different research skills, because that's really um, what it's all about. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, if, if I remember correctly, in um, 2018 at IGSS, that was around um, when you were um, finishing medical school, right, in the final yeah. exam, something like that. Correct. So, I mean, it, it's impressive that within about less than four years or almost four years, you've had all these things done. And it's, it's intriguing to know that you didn't have that in medical school, as in research exposure and et cetera. I mean, it makes me like, um, it encourages me to know that I could actually do more than I have done. And I believe it encourages everyone on, on this platform as well, that irrespective of the fact that you never had any um, research experience as a medical um, student, I mean, it's not lost at all. There's more that you can, that you can do actually. Um, I think there is a question on the uh, platform. Someone is asking as a medical student, what do I do next? If I have a, a research question in mind and probably want to explore it. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so in terms of, I'm going to assume you already have a mentor. If you don't have a mentor, it, it would be great to have one, whether it's through this program or any other mentor that you might personally have and try and discuss with them what is the right um, next steps. Just because depending on what your research question is, the research might look very differently. If your research question is just looking at something in terms of what is currently known about this area of research or this um, specific surgical intervention um, or this specific disease, then you're probably just gonna do a literature review. And that is something that you can do just um, relatively easily, I'm gonna say from home. 
um, because you don't need to see patients, you don't need a, an ethics approval and so forth. However, if your research question is something that's involving clinical care, for example, you want to collect data from patients, you want to collect data from medical charts at your hospital, well, then there's a lot of other steps because then you really want to make sure that you're collecting the right data, but also that you're passing ethics approval, that you're passing all the steps that are required to be able to collect that data and to analyze that data in, in a manner that is um, still ensuring patient privacy. Um, so the best thing is if you have a research question, try and see already in the literature, as I give you a couple of examples with the exploratory um, literature review to see if it's already done. Um, if it's not been done, see if you can find some research that can support you in terms of backing up your research question. So you can say, okay, I wanna do this because this is a research that exists and this, is, this shows why it's important but it also shows that it hasn't been done yet. And that way you can kind of support that as well. Um, but I think it's just very important for you to, to speak to your mentor or trying to identify what are the specific next steps for your research question. And with the next webinars that will come with this program, as I've seen on, on the agenda, it seems that some of those steps will also be answered in, in the coming webinars as well. Exactly, I was, I was actually gonna say that because I think there's a question on um, how do you correct um, or how do you go about reviewing articles? Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you want to talk about that, but... Um, you mean in terms of the literature review? I, I think I think that's what the question is. Yeah. I, I thought it was about systematic review, but I think it's talking about literature review. Yeah. Yeah, so basically, um, once you identify literature, and so let's say you go to PubMed, you do your search, et cetera, you see a bunch of articles, Typically, from the title and the abstract, you can get a sense of whether it's relevant. Let's say you're interested in looking at, at HIV, but the title only talks about malaria. Well, then probably it's not going to be a relevant article. Um, whereas conversely, if the title then also says HIV or it says in the abstract, it's probably going to be a relevant article. And you can then go on and read it. Um, and when reading the article, it's good to read everything um, just as you get started. It might take a bit longer than if you were to just skim it, but it's good to know what is the structure of a research article, what are different methods that people use, and what is this research article specifically trying to do and specifically answering. And that gives you a bit of a flavor of how research is done. But also as you read the introduction, as you read the discussion, you can get a bit of a sense of what other research exists because they typically discuss that as well in the in the research. Um, and with that, you can also see, okay, if I read this entire article, is this still relevant or not? And otherwise you can kind of move on to the next article. So um, again, it's a bit of a lengthier process just because typically it's multiple uh, articles that you will have to cover, but it's a, it's a good practice and it's something that many years from now you'll still continue to do just because it really helps you as a researcher as well. Thank you very much, Dominique. I'm just going to ask one last question. Um, you're one of our mentors. What mm -hmm. are the ideal qualities you would expect from mentees? Because I, I suspect we'll have a number of the mentees um, in the uh, meeting today. What would you expect of a mentee, mm -hmm. the ideal mentee? Yeah, that's a, it's a good question. Um, just because we've all been mentees, and so it's, it's something that... Um, that I am continuing uh, to kind of hone myself as well in terms of um, becoming a better mentee to my current supervisors as well. And it's something that is, is important to continue to do. But I think what is very important is to, first and foremost, is to commit to what you can commit to, um, but not to more in the sense that we all have busy lives, whether it's because of medical school or training, whether it's because of our families, whether it's because of societal initiatives or uh, student bodies and so forth. Um, and that's why it's good to kind of know what is your balance and what can you still fit in in terms of your schedule and that you're not saying yes to too much. Um, because for your mentor, they're trying to support you and they're trying to teach you and they're trying to guide you. Um, but you're also taking time from their schedules as well. So if you are saying yes to too much, but then end up not being able to do uh, uh, most of it, or you end up dropping out because you don't have the time, um, well, then that's a bit unfortunate for everybody involved. So it's good to know what time do you have available and how much do you want to commit to? Um, and what I've uh, quoted, I've been told is, is that it's always good to um, under promise and over deliver as opposed to over promise and under deliver. 
Um, secondly, as a mentee, I think it's always good to be curious and to be engaged with the research. And so it's good to find a research project that you like, whether it's in terms of, again, a clinical area, because you're interested in, let's say, trauma surgery. So try and do something about trauma surgery. If you say, I'm interested in women's health, maybe ob is a good fit. Um, because if, if the research doesn't interest you, it's probably not going to be a good fit for you. And you'll notice that as well with the mentor-mentee relationship. So that's, um, that's the second thing. And then the third thing is that it's totally okay to ask for help. It's totally okay to ask questions. And no question is ever a stupid question. No question is ever a question too many. Because the goal of a mentor-mentee relationship is really for the mentor to support the mentee and guide them um, in the right direction. So if you are a mentee and you feel that you have to do something, but you really don't know what to do, then it's okay to ask the mentor as opposed to doing something where you're not really sure what you're doing and you're just guessing away um, because it, it's really good for you to um, not only know what you're doing, but also because it, it will eventually help you both because the mentor is there again to support you. And that's why it's totally okay for you to, to reach out to them as well. So I think those three are probably the, the most important that I see from, from my perspective. Wow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominique. Thank you for taking the time to to be with us. Um, I think we are almost at the um, end of our scheduled meeting. And um, on behalf of Incision Ghana and on behalf of our um, listeners, we want to say thank you very much. And um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you. And, and hopefully we'll see you in December. Uh, absolutely will. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. I'm also looking forward to uh, the rest of the program. I'm sure it will be a uh, a great one. I uh, see over 200 participants, which is incredibly exciting. So congratulations. Thank you very much, Dominique. Um, I would just uh, um, quickly, for those of you who were not here when we started, um, I'll just uh, quickly go through uh, some of the things we mentioned regarding the mentorship program. And um, All right. So this will be the outline of um, the rest of our program. So our next uh, online webinar would be on the 29th of April, which will be about studying, choosing a study design. That would be handled by, um, that would be handled by Dr. Uh, Mr. Alan Askari um, on the 4th of on the 29th of, of April. Um, for all our mentors who are online, um, we are very grateful and thankful for all that you've done for us and then agreeing to, to help with this program. I would um, quickly acknowledge Gix as well for giving us this platform to use and ACMRCS for sponsoring us and Incision Global, of course. And I would uh, briefly show this video of our sponsors. For all those who have been um, selected as uh, mentees, we would send an email. Actually, we'll send an email to everyone and then acknowledge your status, whether you're on the waiting list or you've been selected as a, a mentee and then who your mentor is. We expect that that should happen within the um, first um, few days of April. And then we expect a meeting between the men mentee and the mentor within um, April. Um, as you already know, we have a very long waiting list. We have much more mentors than mentees 
And so we have no qualms about moving someone if we don't see any progression uh, or if we have complaints from your mentors that you're not engaging, we are gonna take you off the program and put someone else there. For everyone else who will be on the waiting list, we are gonna do organize a project, um, a collaborative project for all those on the waiting list. In addition to that, we are gonna group patients on the waiting list according to interest, because some people put in exactly what they were interested in. We are gonna group you into um, groups of eight to 10, and then you would carry out a systematic review. We'll get someone to take you through the process of a systematic review. And hopefully everybody gets something out of this program, whether you were on the waiting list or you are um, selected as a mentee. I wanna thank you all for taking the time and uh, making it to this meeting. And hopefully you hear from us uh, via email or via WhatsApp and um, see you in April for the next session. Thank you very much.